thank you for this day that we can come together in your name. Lord, we thank you for your presence here. We pray, Lord, as we meet you, Lord, in the gathering of your people and our prayers and our praise and our gifts. Lord, as we meet you in your word and in the breaking of the bread, we pray that we would be changed and we bring glory to your name. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You stand with me and let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pray together. Most merciful God, we confess we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought or word and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives all of our sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, you are forgiven. Amen. Our first hymn is number 174, For All the Saints. Ephesians 2, 
verse 8 says, by, the grace, by, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so, no one, so that no one may boast. It is God's grace that reaches out to fallen sinful people. God sent Jesus to save sinners. Romans chapter 5, verse 6, while we were yet helpless, at that right time, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, verse 8. Verse 10, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. So while we were yet sinners, God reached out for us. Saving grace then begins working in us even while we're sinners. God chose us before we were born. And saving grace should keep us very, very humble. Because it's a reminder that our salvation is about how good God is, how kind God is, how gracious he is, not how good we are. Saving grace isn't about what we have done, but what God has done for us, and he has done it all. So what does this mean to us? It means that we can rest in the Lord, knowing that he's paid the price. He's done the work, he's finished the job, and it was done by Jesus, not ourselves. And because of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection, we can lay our heads down at night and we can say, by God's grace, I've been saved. Thank you, Lord. You accept me. You love me. You forgive me. You're satisfied with me. And that's a wonderful thing to be able to have peace with God through Jesus Christ. But the truth is, there's two parts in salvation. That's what we saw in our, our story this morning. We got a preview with our children's sermon, right? There's two parts to salvation. There's God's part, and God's part is all the hard part. Our part is the easy part, but we still have a part to play. It's our part to surrender to his love and grace. So in other words, we can say it like this. Grace must be received in faith to have effect, and that's this morning's sermon is grace received. So in order for grace to have effect, it has to be received. In other words, it's potential grace until it's been received in faith. Our part's simple. We're to believe and we're to receive. And sometimes the simplicity of our part can, can cause problems for people. Now, it's a good, I think we, we can begin a policy here at Emmanuel Church that works like this. If I tell a story more than three times, not knowing, not remembering that I did, you could just wave at me. Okay? <laughs> if you can remember that I told the story three times. <laughs> I, I don't think I've told you this story, but if I did, and it's only the second time, we've got to give you one more chance. And so when, when we were in Russia, I was doing evangelizations, going to different villages and renting halls, and I was preaching the gospel of Jesus to people who'd never even seen a Bible, never heard the gospel, never stepped foot in church. And I remember I had a group of people, I don't remember it being particularly big, maybe 30, 40 people, and uh, there was a lot of uh, older ladies there, and I was saying that Jesus Christ is here. He's ready to forgive. He's God the Son, the Son of God. He's been raised from the dead. He sits now at the right hand of the Father. He has paid all of sin's price and cost with his death. And now it's up to you if you'll receive what Jesus has done for you. His grace is here. He's reaching out to you. Will you receive? And I said, just to, so it's clear, your job is to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross is to believe that God raised him from the dead. It's to believe that he's taken away sin. And to receive this gift of life. And an old lady stood up and interrupted me and said, No, no, no. I said, Do you not believe in Jesus Christ? She said, No, I, 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 I believe. But it can't be that easy. It can't be that simple, can it? And she was, she was just astounded with the simplicity of the gospel. She knew something about church. She was one of the people who had gone to the Orthodox Church, and she knew about the rules and the regulations and about this thing and this thing, and you have to do this and not do that and this. And the idea that you could be saved and made right with God by believing in faith was a hard thing for her. And sometimes I like to say receiving Christ is the easiest and the hardest thing in the world to do. It's the easiest thing because what he calls us to do is to go ahead and surrender to him. And if we surrender to him, then he'll take it from there. His part is to breathe life inside us, to make us alive to him. His part is to write our name in his book of life. That's his part. Our part is to surrender to him. And it can be hard because, well, our mind is filled with all, like, this can't work, this can't be that easy, well, I have to do this or that. 
in other different regions like that to not receive his, his grace. I used to tell people, I used to use my son as an example. When he was 16, we got him a guitar. He's a, a guitar player and got him a nice guitar for his 16th birthday when we visited the United States. And I would have him stand up in front of everyone and I'd say, okay, we got this gift for my son. It's a guitar. And I said, son, it's really a beautiful guitar. It has wonderful sound. It's electric acoustic. It's got, it's great. Hook it up to the sound. You're going to love it. And he would stand there with his hands behind his back and say, oh, dad, I love that guitar. It's beautiful. Oh, I bet it sounds great. Oh, yeah. And I'd, I'd keep pushing it toward him and say, well, son, it's, it's, it's yours. We got it for you. We bought it for you. And he'd say, oh, I love the, I love the color. I love, yeah, it's beautiful. I like how it has those leaves on it. i say, take it, take it. And then I would say, you know, if he doesn't receive that, it has no value. And that's how it is with, with God's grace, is God's grace is available to people, but it has to be received in faith. And so people would understand. Now listen to God's word in 2 Corinthians 6, chap, uh, chapter 6, verse 1. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. So for some people, grace is in vain. It has no power, it has no effect, because they don't truly receive it in faith. For he says, verse 2, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. And I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. God sent me, I told this lady, to preach his gospel to you. And if you will believe and receive, he'll make you alive in Christ. And so her and many other people uh, received the grace of God that day. And you know, I was blessed to get to see this happen over hundreds of times in different villages and towns. And then to go back, you know, the next year to check on people and check on the works that we are involved in and to see the fingerprints of God on these new believers as their lives were changed and transformed by the grace of God. Because the same grace that saves us transforms us as well. And I told it is, I would tell these people, I tell every people, all people that whether no matter what country I'm in, our country, I tell people this all of the time, right? When, when, if a person wants to receive the grace of God, their part is found in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. If you will confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, if you'll believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's God's promise to people. That if we believe, if we confess, and we receive, God's word goes on to say, for it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess that you confess and are saved. So I want us to look for a few moments at Zacchaeus as an example of grace received. And uh, as I said in the children's sermon, one of the things we know right away is that he was a chief tax collector. You know, the word chief tax collector is only used for Zacchaeus in the New Testament. Nowhere else is it, there's tax collectors, but there's no other chief tax collectors. So I think that we could say that he was a sinner and a really good sinner. He was a well-established sinner. And uh, he was a serious sinner, and he was hated by his fellow Jew Jews because he was considered a treacherous traitor working for the Romans. But the real problem for Zacchaeus was not that he would be willing to work for the Romans, but that he was a liar, a cheat, and a thief who used his position to steal from God's own people. And it's important for us to really make a note of this, but in spite of being a wretched sinner, a serious sinner, listen to this. He had an interest in knowing who Jesus was. Isn't that interesting? Oftentimes we think of serious sinners, people who like, you know, you imagine, right? God's people, the Jews, they looked at this guy and they just, that guy? They couldn't imagine that he had any interest in God. His, his very actions said that he does, had no interest in God. And yet, inside of him was a, was a heart. He had a heart that was interested in knowing who God was. And I've seen that many times myself in life. We find people who you wouldn't imagine have a thirst for God. But, but in them, they do. Even people who are dysfunctional, people who are damaged, people who are very lost, have a, oftentimes will have an interest in knowing who Jesus was. And I also want us to note this, right? He was seeking to see who Jesus was. Now, sometimes people say, well, you know, I have an interest in God, but they won't move. They certainly won't go out of their house. They won't go to the places where Jesus is. 
Right? This guy left and went to find Jesus because he heard that Jesus was going to be there. Well, Jesus, just for the record, has made an appointment with his people every Sunday. You can meet Jesus every single Sunday. Not that you can't meet him in different places. Not that you couldn't meet him if you gathered in the woods or something like that. But there's people who say, yeah, I have an interest in Jesus, but not an interest enough to get out the door and do something about it. Zacchaeus wasn't like that. He's a good example of a person who wanted to receive the grace of God. Because he not only went out the door, he, when he couldn't find Jesus, he didn't give up. It would have been easy for him to go, yeah, you know what? I'm always the shortest one. I can't see anything. I'm not going to hear anything. I might as well just go home. Maybe I'll catch a football game on the TV. No, I'm not. Wrong, wrong era. Sorry. <laughs> Instead, he went and found a tree to climb up. So he was seeking Jesus. And I think it's interesting to see this. He was very, he was, he was active in trying to find him. And somehow he understood who Jesus was when he saw him. Now, we don't know exactly how that happened. We don't know, was Jesus, did he know ahead of time? Did he hear about Jesus? Was, was it the fact that maybe Jesus was preaching as he was walking through there? We don't know. It doesn't tell us. Did he stop and heal someone and he saw the power of God through Jesus right then and there? We don't know. We just know that somehow when he saw Jesus, he understood this was the Messiah. This was one who could forgive sin. And Jesus, and like I said to George, I, the amazing thing is, right, that he was seeking Jesus and Jesus was seeking him. And he says, Zacchaeus, come down from there. And he comes down and he says, today I'm going to stay at your house. Now, Here's, I think, a really interesting thing, right? He responded to the knowledge that Jesus was the Lord. And once he knew, right, once he knew who Jesus was, Zacchaeus responded with joy, with obedience, and with repentance. Many aren't like that. Zacchaeus. They don't respond even though grace is there, right? They say they want to know God, but they don't seek Him. They say... They say that they've seen Jesus is the Son of God, but they've done nothing of what Zacchaeus did. They've believed, right? They say, yeah, I believe. How many, how many people say we meet, right, on a daily basis will say, yeah, I believe. Sure, I believe. But they've not responded to his grace. They haven't actually received his grace. They just simply say, yeah, I believe. Well, there's believing and there's believing, right? Real belief trusts and relies on Jesus. They, they say they believe, but they go back to their lives unchanged, unsaved, never having actually received the grace of God. They received him, some received Christ. They say, okay, I believe. I want that grace so that I can be saved. But then not responded with repentance. You're welcome here, Lord. You can eat at my table. You can stay in my home. But I'm not ready to actually admit that I'm a savior, a sinner in need of a savior. I'm not ready to throw myself on your mercy. I'll live my life as I have, but I'll say that you're my Savior. But the bad news is that grace is in vain. If Zacchaeus had just welcomed Jesus into his home and fed him a meal and given him a bed to eat and said, me and Jesus, we're like this, man, we're friends, is that grace would have been in vain. It was because he responded with, with repentance and understood that here was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Son, and he said, I will change my life. I will, I will quit living my life the way I want to live it, and I'll live it the way that's going to please you. The grace that isn't received is in vain. It won't save, it won't transform, because it actually hasn't been received but been rejected. Now, others have received Jesus, and they've even repented, but they haven't actually received him with joy. Some Christians receive Jesus, but they act like it's a hardship. They act like it's some difficult thing that they would be called to serve the living Son of God. They act like it would be some difficult thing to uh, do his bidding, acting as if they're doing God a favor by serving him. They say, you saved me, <clears throat> thank God. And then they act like it's a hardship. Zach Zacchaeus sought Jesus, he heard, and he believed. When Jesus called him, he responded with joy. He repented, he turned from living his way to living God's way. His repentance included making things right as best as he could. His repentance included making changes in the way that he lived, in the way he worked, in the way he dealt with people. In other words, 
he took his value system and his way of living and he moved it to the side and he took the kingdom's way of living and said, this is the way I'm going to live from here on out. He received the grace of God and Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. Jesus has come into the world to save sinners. God offers his grace, his saving grace. Have we received it and received it wholeheartedly with joy, inviting him into our home and into our heart? That we see, received his grace with repentance, willing to change and do life his way. To not say, just forgive me, but Lord, I'll quit doing what's sinful and displeasing to you, and I'll live your way. Grace received brings salvation to our home and to our heart. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for the gift of grace that you have sent Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Son, to die in our place. Lord, let us not treat your grace disrespectfully or like it's some small thing, but with a whole and an open heart, receive your grace. Lord, receive you. Receive your spirit. And Lord, let it be our, our prayer and our purpose, Lord, that we would live our lives to please you since you have saved us, you have made us alive, and you have given us a new life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Our hymn is number <coughs> 305. Jesus paid it all in the celebration hymn. <laughs>
I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Lord, we offer you 
our offerings with thanksgiving, with worship, in our lives as well. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's greet each other with God's peace. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks. It is right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For what had been hidden from before the foundation of the world, you have made to the no made, you have made known to the nations in your Son. In him being found in the substance of our mortal nature, you have manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace.
promise, the spirit of your Lord, love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those whom you have fed with one heavenly food through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we go from this place, let's go with the joy of received grace. And remember that we're yet, we're the church, we're Emmanuel. God is with us and in us. We're his hands to reach out to those around us, his lips to speak words of love and life, his word of grace. His feet to take him where he wants to go. So let's be on mission. Be bold in the Holy Spirit to encourage those who are discouraged. Pray with those who are burdened. Share the words of Jesus with those around you. And as you go about your week, may the Lord bless you. And may the Lord keep you. May the Lord take great care of you. May the Lord make his face shine in you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 617 in the celebration hymnal, Near to the Heart of God. Amen.